Well, if we've opened our Bibles, we're going to be looking at chapter 14, verses 22 through 26, as we continue our series here in the Gospel of Mark. We're looking at uh, 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 the Last Supper. We're taking a closer look at the Last Supper. And so, as is my normal way of teaching, I'm going to read to you from verse 22 to verse 26. I'm going to remind you, refresh your memory of a few things that are taking place, and then pick up at verse 26 and move us, uh, rather verse 22, and move us into verse 26. So, beginning at verse 22, Mark chapter 14, reading to verse 26, Mark writes, then the disciples looked at one another, oh, rather, excuse me, I'm looking at John. I had to do some, not this, John, I don't want to do that too much. <laughs> I was looking at the Gospel of John, and I'm thinking, no, that's not how, okay, we'll start over again, chapter 14, verse 22. As they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them and said, take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. Assuredly, I say to you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I, I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And so as mentioned, I'm going to give you a little bit of a review. That way we're together on the same page as we move into the verses before us. We know that Jesus had just spoken to his disciples. And he had said to them, one of you will betray me. Now, that had caused his men to ask among themselves, who could do such a thing? Luke tells us in his gospel, chapter 22, verse 23, that, that they began to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this. You see, his words had torn into their hearts. It had caused them to introspect. It caused them to look within themselves, to question themselves and and one by one, each asked if it could have been them. Uh, they began to be sorrowful, the Scripture says, to say to him, one by one, is it I? And another said, is it I? Now, Matthew gives more detail in chapter 26 of his gospel, verses 24 and 25. Jesus said there, the Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? He said to him, you have said it. So when Judas asked if it was he, Jesus affirmed his self-condemnation. Now notice how Jesus didn't directly accuse him of being the betrayer. He affirmed, he affirmed that Judas had condemned himself in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 12, verse 37, Jesus said, by your words you'll be justified, by your words you shall, you will be condemned. So by his own words, he condemned himself. Now at the supper, Jesus had been asked to identify who this traitor is. It's found in John 13, verses 23 through 26. It says, one of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him, Simon Peter motioned to this disciple and said, ask him which one he means. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I've dipped it in the dish. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. So at that time, Jesus was presiding over the meal. He was giving each man his portion so when John asked the question, Jesus was about to give a portion to Judas. Now, one commentator pointed out that this act was one of friendship and one of love. It was one more act of kindness and service that Jesus had rendered to, to Judas. Now, to keep Judas from further participating in the supper, Jesus dismissed him. You see, Judas is now fully committed to the betrayal of Christ. In John 13, 27, it says, After the piece of bread, Satan entered him. Jesus said to him, What you do, do quickly. In John 13, verse 30, it says, As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out, and it was night. So after Judas left, Jesus continued ministering to his men. 
You see, in light of Judas's betrayal, Jesus desires to unify the disciples. Judas had tremendous influence on the men. They could have been greatly shaken. For one of the most trusted men to do something like that would shatter the unity of the apostles. So Jesus needed to keep their eyes on who they were and what they were to do. Now, why is that so important? Well, these were the men who were to take his message throughout the world. To do so required that they would be united in heart and in purpose. Now, what's the glue that's going to keep them together? What is going to keep these men unified as they go out into the world preaching the gospel? Well, first, it's going to be their love for Christ, their love for Jesus that's built on his sacrificial death for them. That will unify them. Their love for the Lord is going to keep them faithful in the trying days ahead, but his love for them will provoke them to hold fast in love to him. So first, it's going to be the love for Christ and, and their mutual love of Jesus Christ, but it's also going to be their love for one another. That is going to keep them going strong. You see, relationship with other believers is what strengthens you in your walk. As fellow believers, they would draw strength for one another's faith. They would benefit from their knowledge of Christ as it was shared amongst them, and they would also exercise their gifts and build one another up. You see, the days ahead were going to grow more difficult. They needed to be there for one another. They needed fellowship. When this COVID thing hit, one of the first things that was done was, was the forbidding of us to gather together. People in general were told, remain in your homes and all of that. Well, what also that did is it began to work itself into the church, and we discovered that many people were beginning to become lonesome and that they were alone. And, and the first thing God ever said in Scripture that is not good is for the man to be alone. And so we learned even firsthand how difficult it is to live for Christ without having companions or friendship or unity, people that you can, you can work together with and fellowship with and pray with and encourage and all of that. When I was in the military, I was stationed in Fort Bragg. I was a new Christian. I'd only uh, been saved for a few months, and, and I had gone into my basic, went through jump school, ended up with the 82nd in Fort Bragg. And, and there I am, a young man, 20 years old, and as I'm there in this particular place, I have no friends. And, and before you know it, I began to, to just slowly lose the fire that had been burning so, so, so brightly in my heart. I, I, I remember that it was, I was alone. There, was no, there were no other believers to my knowledge. I was brand new in the, uh, in the barracks and all, didn't know anybody. And so I would go to bed at night uh, when the sun went down. I didn't know anybody, so I'd go and I'd just go to sleep. I'd go to sleep very early. Well, there was a sergeant. I forget his name. I think it was Sergeant Garcia. I think that was his name. I know he was a Mexican guy because when I came home, he said, would you please on leave, bring me some chorizo when you get back. So I remember him very well. I became his friend because I started smuggling chorizo to him. But anyway, <laughs> he and I were talking one day, and, uh, and I was sharing the gospel with Sergeant Garcia and um, didn't think anything of it. And a little while after that, he comes walking into, into my cubicle, and there's this guy walking with him that I've never seen before. And Garcia looks at me, and he says, he says, Rosales, he goes, this here, he goes, this guy's like you. And I, I looked at him, what, what do you mean? He goes, he's like you. He's one of you. He's one of you. I said, what do you mean? And so he goes, he's a Christian. He's a Christian. And I looked at, his name was Danny. I looked at Danny, and I said, so you're a Christian? And he looks at me, are you a Christian? So I look back at him, I'm a Christian. And he looks back at me, so am I. And what had happened is Garcia found one of, he said, one of you, one of guys like you. Danny was a very strong believer in Christ. He was the answer to a prayer that I'd been praying. I was alone. I had nobody to fellowship with. I, I'm a brand new Christian. I'm only a few months old in the Lord. It's very easy to backslide in the military. Every vet knows that. It's very easy to just hang around with the guys. In, where I was stationed, there was anything to do. So one of the guys in my cubicle, he, he would go to the bar every Friday. They'd go into town into Fayetteville. They'd drink and get in fights. That's what they did. That's what they would do. They'd get drunk and jump off of buildings because they're paratroopers. They were crazy, but that's what they would do. Now, I'm by myself. I've got nobody to talk to. 
I talk to Garcia. Garcia brings in Rendon, and before you know it, I've got a friend. And Danny was very important for me in my early walk with Christ. He was part of a group called the Navigators. The Navigators were, were known for their memorization of, of Scripture. He began to teach me how to memorize the Bible. We had fellowship, and for a year, year and a half, he and I were very, very tight, very close, and God provided that. I needed that, and so do all of us in this room. Everyone in this room needs somebody who can provoke them to godliness. Every one of us needs somebody who can pray for us or know our heart. Every one of us needs somebody that we can call and speak to, that we can have fellowship with, that we can go out for a meal with, that we can bear our burdens to. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 10, 24, and 25, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do. But encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. I'm very grateful that we have the ability to broadcast our message. We reach a lot of places, different states, even other countries with the message of the gospel. I'm blessed. We do have some from our fellowship who uh, have been kind of like playing hooky from fellowship. And I know you're watching, so I'm talking to you. And uh, you need to come home. Because we need each other. We need to be in fellowship with one another. We need to enjoy Jesus as a fellowship. And see, that's what, it, that's what it's all about. Jesus wants to keep the unity of these people because they're going to go out and preach the gospel. It was on that night that, that Jesus emphasized the priority of loving one another. This love for him and love for one another is actually going to be the earmark of a Christian. In John 13, verses 33 through 35, which is taking place this night, Jesus said, My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I'm going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And so this is the night that this is taking place. He's commanding them to have fellowship, to have unity, and to have love for, for one another. Now notice in verse 22, it says, as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them and said, take, eat, this is my body. This is the last Passover ever held that God honors. This foreshadows Jesus. I mentioned to you out of 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 through 8, that the apostle Paul said this. He said to the church, your, your boasting's not good. Don't you know that a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast that you may be a new batch without yeast, as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival, not with the old yeast, the yeast of malice and wickedness, but with bread without yeast, the bread of sincerity and truth. As we've been going through uh, Mark and, and sharing various things, I, I've mentioned to you that the Passover foreshadows the death of Christ. That's a picture, but the reality has come through Jesus when Paul was writing to a church in Colossae, in Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, Paul said, Therefore do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These, he said, are, sh are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Celebrating freedom from Egypt is a weak substitute for deliverance of sin. We do not look to a lamb in Egypt as our final symbol of redemption. We look to the lamb of God dying as a substitute for us on the cross. Well, it says again, verse 22, as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it. Now, the Passover supper is still in progress. And now Jesus is instituting communion. And this may be the point where the roasted lamb is served. See, we're going to be having communion. I encourage you to be with us on Wednesday night. You're getting an insight into what takes place. 
Notice again in verse 22, he takes bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and then he gave it. He's instituting a new celebration. It's something that is replacing the old. In a few hours, he's going to completely fulfill the type of the sacrificial lamb. As the lamb of God, he's going to die a bloody death on a cross. So a new symbol is about to replace the old. Jesus took bread, it says in verse 22. He blessed it, broke it, and gave it. Now, when it says he, he blessed it, the blessing is part of the Passover supper. You see, at this point in the Passover supper, there is an explanation of its purpose. Exodus 12, verses 24 through 27, when it's being inaugurated, these are the commands that were given concerning Passover. Obey these instructions as a lasting ordinance for you and your descendants when you enter the land that the Lord will give you as he promised. Observe this ceremony. And when your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? Then tell them it is a Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. I want to emphasize something that was said in the command. When your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? Then tell them. It would be the head of the home normally, the host of the supper who would explain this. Most often it would have been the father. As a father, I have responsibility, I had responsibility and continue even though my children are all adult children with children of their own. But I had and remain having the responsibility of explaining. When they ask, you tell them. It, it doesn't say when they ask, then the mother tells them. The father would do that. Why? Because the responsibility of raising the kids in the faith of God fell on the father's shoulders. Unfortunately, sometimes that's not possible in a home because perhaps there's no father. But the reality of it and the way God designed it was for me as a husband and as a father to be the explainer of these things. And it's part of the ritual. What would take place, and it happens to this day, is there's a certain point in the Passover supper where the question is asked, what does this mean? And it's a father's responsibility to be able to say these things happen in this way. And so I encourage all of us as men and all of us who are fathers I encourage us to know the explanation, to not rely on, on somebody else to give the explanations of faith in my home. As a man, I have the responsibility of, quote, unquote, being the priest of the home. I have the responsibility of leading devotions. I have the responsibility of making sure the children get up and, and get to church. I have those responsibilities. And so that's how it, how it works best. So when the children ask, then you tell them, now, Jesus is explaining this new ordinance. He, he, he first, he takes bread, he blesses, he, he, he breaks it, and he says, take and eat. This is my body. Now, let me speak the obvious. He is, he is not speaking literally that this bread in his hand is changing into his physical body. That's obvious. He's holding that bread. He's saying that the bread is representing his body, but in what way? Well, the bread is unleavened. And that would represent separation from the decay of sin. It represented to the Jews a separation from idolatry and worldliness. You see, Jesus referred to himself in John 6, 35 as the bread of life. Jesus is free of sin. He sacrificed himself for us. And, and this supper is to remind us of this for our lifetime. Luke twenty two nineteen 19 says that he, he took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, gave it to them, saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Christianity is not simply a philosophy. Christianity is not us just performing religious ritual. Christianity is is the complete assimilation of Jesus Christ into our lives. When you eat and you drink, you're assimilating into your life. What you eat and drink is giving life to your body. When you take of communion, you are assimilating the reality of what Christ has done for you. It, it is a means of grace whereby God gives to us insight into how he strengthens us in the inner man. You see, to be saved, 
we receive Jesus Christ, whose body was sacrificed, whose body was given for us. And in giving each of the men a piece of the bread, he was not only feeding them in a spiritual way, giving a spiritual sense of what's taking place, but he's also reinforcing something. He's reinforcing their unity because each were given bread from the same single loaf. So they're sharing of the same loaf. They're partaking together in a symbolic way of who Jesus is, our bread of life. It says in verse 23, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them. And so, once again, this cup that is spoken of is the cup that was taken after supper. It's traditionally referred to as the third cup. During the time of Christ, drinking from the cup four times would occur in Passover. Each time that the cup was filled, it had a different name. The first cup was called the cup of sanctification. The second cup that they had in the meal, the cup of plagues. The third cup is called the cup of redemption or the cup of blessing. And the fourth cup is called the cup of praise or the cup of acceptance. Now, the third cup, which is being partaken of here, was taken after the lamb had been served. That would be the cup that the apostle Paul speaks of in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 16, when he says, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The, the bread that we break is it not a participation in the body of Christ? And, and verse 23 tells us that he gave the cup to them and they all drank from it. Again, we are personally responsible for taking, for eating, for drinking. We all are to personally receive the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on our behalf. Now notice verse 24, how it says, he said to them, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many, the blood of the new covenant. A new covenant has been made, and this new covenant, which we call the New Testament, the new covenant is ratified by the blood of Jesus Christ. This is how God ratified covenants in the Old Testament. God would ratify Old Testament covenants through the shedding of blood in sacrifice. In Exodus 24, verse 8, Moses then took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, this is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. You see, in the Old Testament, blood sacrifice was necessary to establish fellowship with God. You see, he requires complete dedication. In Hebrews 9, 22, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Leviticus 17, 14, the life of all flesh is the blood. So the shedding of Jesus' blood provides atonement for sin, and his blood made atonement for the sins of all mankind. Hebrews 9, 14 says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself, without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Jesus was establishing the new covenant, and the new covenant is ratified by his blood. You see, the old covenant Israel had had been broken. That old covenant God had made with the nation was broken. In the Old Testament book of Jeremiah, one of the prophets, Jeremiah, in chapter 31, verses 31 to 32, we read, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. Jesus is establishing a new covenant, a covenant that had been promised. It's a covenant of grace, a covenant of salvation. In Jeremiah 31, he went on into verse 33 to say this, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God. They shall be my people. God has written 
his word on the tablets of flesh, our heart. The Old Testament, we, we see that God gave to the children of Israel tablets of stone. It had the ten words or the ten commands, and it was given to Moses. Well, those words that were, were made on, on stone were words that you would look at, but not necessarily um, from the inside necessarily respond to. What God has done is God has given to us his, his, his word, his command, but it's not simply in pages of the, the book that we study called the Bible, but he has actually written his word on, on the tablets of our hearts. So there are things within us that motivate us from the inside to love and be obedient to God. You know, somebody, when I first got saved, one of, my, one of my friends said to me, hey, let's do this. I forget whether it was drinking or whether it was smoking some marijuana. I forget what. But he said to me this. He says, you want some? And I said, he said, you want some of this? I said, no, no, I'm, I'm good. And he says, oh, that's right. He said, you're a Christian. You can't do that anymore. And I looked at him. It was drinking. I looked at him. I said, I can't do what? He said, you can't, you can't drink anymore. And I'm looking at him and I'm thinking, I can drink you under the table. What do you mean you can't drink anymore? But I didn't want to drink anymore. That's a difference. It's not that I can't. I told him that. I said, listen, I can, but I don't want to. I don't have the want to. I don't have the desire anymore. See, I, I drank enough of gutter water to know what, what pure water tastes like. I prefer the pure. I, I prefer, the, and it's, yeah, it's true. I, I you know, as a little boy, I literally drank gutter water to gross girls out. I literally did that. I know firsthand the difference between, you know, some nice clean water and gutter water. I know the difference. I know it by physical act, but I also know it spiritually. I drank of the water of the world, and I don't want it anymore. Pastor David, why don't you go out on your wife, Marie? Oh, that's right, you're a Christian. You know, the reason I don't go out on my wife, Marie, is because I have a love in my heart for my wife, Marie. There's something within me that keeps me from ever wanting to be with anybody else. And that is because God has given me a woman that I cherish and love and will always forever the rest of my life. That's how it works. Oh, you, yeah, of course, even in the pastoral ministry, without saying too much other than to say this, I've been doing this for a long time. I haven't always been uh, an old man. And there have been people in my past in this church who have attempted to take me away from my wife. I've never been tempted to go with anybody else. Why not? Because you're afraid to get caught? No, because I'm in love with somebody whose her love has been written on the tablet of my heart. So I understand God's word being on your heart. You don't do things because of any other reason other than God has provoked you from within to be obedient to him. And see, in the Old Testament, the, the nation of Israel had the, the tablets of stone, but God said, I'll write my word on the tablet of your heart. And that's what he's done. He has given to us his word. It's in us. And so the cup of redemption reveals more than just an escape from Egypt. It reveals the purpose of God in salvation, judgment and salvation, wrath and redemption are all revealed in this cup. You see, Jesus is going to pour out his blood for the salvation of the world, and they are all to drink from this cup. Again, that symbolizes the unity uh, that Jesus had with his men. It, it, it represents their union with him. By celebrating together, it shows the visible and the spiritual unity of the body of Christ because together they're celebrating, they're remembering him and what he has done. Now in verse 25, he says, Assuredly, I say to you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until I drink it new in the kingdom of God. In Luke 22, verse 16, Luke says, I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. So the promise to drink of the fruit and to eat the meal is really a promise of a future. He will again celebrate with them in his millennial kingdom. You see that in Ezekiel 45. You see, when my kingdom is established, you're going to be there with me. When you eat of this supper, remember me. 
Remember me. Remember me. I've mentioned when we receive communion how that part of the connotation of remembering as it is understood uh, in, in Scripture. Part of the connotation of remembering is, is not just recollecting, but re-experiencing. There are things that you can remember that may be historic events. There are other things that you remember, and there's a certain element of memory that has emotional participation. I've shared this with you before recently. I shared how, how I, I lived in Norwalk. My brother Frank got saved. I needed, he needed fellowship. He needed to be discipled. He didn't go to church. He was living in Ontario. I lived in Norwalk. And so I began to drive from Norwalk to Ontario to where my brother lived. And... I began teaching him a Bible study in this small apartment. And I still remember, and I do with emotion, the day a young woman came walking in that door in this teeny little room that only held a handful of people. And I remember my brother's voice when he said, David, this is Marie. I still remember that. I still hear it. And I still get emotional thinking about it. Today, November 13th, is my son David's birthday. He's 44 years old today, my boy. And I still remember when I was in that, that room when my, my girl gave birth to my son, how the doctor said, David, you had a little boy. What's his name? I was planning on naming my son Aaron. That's my favorite male name, Aaron. And I had told Marie, I'm going to name him Aaron. She said, aren't you going to give him your name? I said, he could be Aaron David. But I love the name Aaron. It's my favorite name. So the doctor says to me, what are you going to name him? As the baby was handed to me, I still remember this with emotion. I looked at that ugly little face. <laughs> His name is David. I still remember that. And I still tear up 44 years ago, and I still transport my heart back to remember. So when you take communion, it's supposed to have something that grips your heart. It isn't simply taking a piece of bread and a cup of juice and eating and drinking together. It symbolizes much more. Again, in part of the way we're taught through the way of Hebrew thinking, it is not only remembering certain events, but participating in them. One Jewish scholar wrote, in the Bible, remembering is not the retention or recollection of a mental image, but a focusing upon the object of memory that results in an action. And so, do this in remembrance of me is not just my emotionally experience something of my love for Christ, his love for me, but it's also a motivation for me to do something because I remember. Because I remember what Christ has done, I remember he did it for me, and, I, and I'm motivated to action, to, to activity. And so he's saying, when my kingdom is established, you're going to be there with me. This ought to motivate you to do these things in remembrance of me. Remember me. Sometimes we forget people too easily. Sometimes we just forget them. I think of so much as I'm speaking to you right now. 
Any emotions run through me? I have a dear, very dear friend who's going through some very severe dementia. And when they were diagnosed with it, they were sitting across the table from Marie and me. And with tears in their eyes, they said, I'm going to forget. I'm going to forget. And they have. And we've watched the severity of this. But I remember saying to them when they said, I'm going to forget you. I remember saying to them, but I'll never forget you. Remember me. When you take the bread, when you take up the cup, remember me. And may that provoke you to serve, to give my word. I will drink it anew with you in the kingdom. You see, Jesus said in John 14, the same night when he's sharing of, of these things about betrayal and, and, and the apostle Peter and the others are wondering, who's it going to be? And in the same night in John 14, hearing that there's going to be such a betrayal, Jesus could be saying, my, my words may trouble you. But remember, I'm, I, I'm coming again in John 14. Let, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Let not your heart be troubled. Don't be greatly concerned. I'm going to come for you. And until I come, be busy. Occupy until I come. And do so not because you're forced to. Do so not because, oh, people have to do this to be good. Do this because you remember me. You remember my love. You remember my sacrifice. You remember what I've taught you. You remember everything and my promises. Do this in remembrance of me. Remember me. Because that will motivate you. That will strengthen you. That gives you hope. It gives you faith. It gives you the ability to perform those things that are so difficult sometimes. So difficult sometimes. Remember me. My father's house are many mansions. My father's house are many dwelling, dwelling places. As I shared with you, in Israel we go to a particular place that, that, that our guide pointed out and said, the way it works in Israel is you'd have the father's house and they would build sons' homes next to it so it'd become a family, kind of a grouping of houses. And when Christ was speaking about in my father's house are many mansions, the word mansion there is a word that literally means places of abode or dwelling places. He's simply saying the family's going to be together. I'm going to come and take you to be with myself and we're going to be together in our community as a family that loves one another. That's why we don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some is. That's why we don't, because we're family. And so as Jesus is saying this, he closes in verse 26 and by simply saying, well, it says, when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. They were singing what would be called a psalm of praise. Um, commentators point out that it's very very likely that, that they sang out of the Psalms, Psalm 113 to 118, which are called also the Psalms of Ascent, but they're songs of praise. And Psalm 118, for example, it says in verse 5 and 6, I called on the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and set me in a broad place. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? 
Psalm 118, verse 8, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Psalm 118, 13, I was pushed back and about to fall, but the Lord helped me. Psalm 118, 24, this is the day which the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. As he's on his way to his betrayal, soon to be placed on, on a cross, they're singing songs of praise because God's work is about to be concluded. They're on their way to the Mount of Olives. They're making their way to a garden called Gethsemane, and he's preparing for the cross. And no longer are they the 12. They are now the 11 because Judas has made his way out to betray him. Our Father, we ask,